The Office on NBC is a popular comedy familiar to anyone with a television or the 54 people with access to Amazon Unbox. The show is about real life in an office, but behind the fun and attractive world depicted by the likable cast, there is a shadow world lived by grubby, nearsighted writers in the actual offices inside the Dunder Mifflin building. Welcome to the writer's block, a round table with the writers of the office. Before we take questions from the room, we want to show you where many of the scenes that appeared on the show come from. Our own work days. One day, Greg caught us watching the DVD screensaver instead of coming up with new ideas. Luckily, we managed to convince him that we were working, and then we had to put it in the show. Being very athletic, we writers often toss around the old pig skin. It's a great way to brainstorm crazy new creative bits for the show. One day, we realized that Justin Spitzer is a drunk. While tragic, we tried to make comedy out of it. Yes, over the years, we have used many of the real things that go on around our offices to make comedy for the office. And who am I, you may be asking? Well, my name is Brent Forrester, and my story was the basis for Ed Truck's accident in grief counseling. For you see, at the beginning of season three, I was decapitated in a car accident. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome the writers of The Office. Introduce yourselves and also maybe say an episode that you're uh, proud of writing, proud to be involved in writing. Give the people out here, I know a lot of them know exactly who you are, but give those that don't a good sense of uh, how much you've contributed to the office. I'm Greg Daniels, I'm proud of writing Blue's Clue. I'm Robert, and I'm proud of writing The Secret. Uh, I'm like sure I'm most proud of rewriting a secret. <laughs> I'm Justin Spitzer. I uh, wrote Back from Vacation. Uh, I'm Ryan Co. I'm you, and I'm proud to one day maybe get to write an episode. <laughs> I'm Spitzky, and I'm proud of helping Mike rewrite me a secret. I'm Jason Kessler, and I'm proud of Green Thoughts. Uh, I'm Minnie Kaling, and uh, I'm proud of my first episode, Hot Girl. I'm BJ Novak, I'm proud of writing Diversity Day. I'm proud of playing the role of Ryan on The Office. <laughs> I also wrote an episode called Deposition that will be coming up soon, so... Uh, I'm Anthony Farrell, and... Uh, in Canada, um, uh, the coolest thing I've read so far is that Kevin talking ahead with the PB and j thing. Uh, I'm Ken Subornak, I produce all this guy's crap. We're going to get started with a few uh, fan questions submitted on the internet, and then we'll sort of feel free to, to improvise here a little bit. Um, first question comes from Kristen in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And I'm not, I'm not sure about this. It seems as though you have established an ideal work environment from which to create. To what do you attribute the collaborative nature between the writers, cast, and crew? Uh, the process by which we make the show is incredibly organic and, uh, and very grassrootsy. And um, as you all probably know, a lot of our Writers are actors, and a lot of our actors are writers, and that was Greg's conception of the show from the beginning, was um, there is, at some shows uh, out in Hollywood land, there's a very uh, weird division between actors and writers, and um, you don't get to interact much with actors if you're a writer, and obviously vice versa. And the whole point of the show is to sort of break down those barriers, and um, 
When you write an episode, you're on the set for every uh, minute of the shooting of it, and you work really closely with the directors, and we have, over the years, developed a real kind of fun shorthand between the actors and the writers and the directors, and um, it's just a very relaxed environment, and I think that that really helps us because um, there's no sense of weirdness or something. If the actor has a question, they just come to us, and if we uh, want to let the actors improvise and try to improve the, the dumb stuff that we've written, then we do that too. And um, it just is a very uh, calm and relaxed sort of uh, big happy commune that we work on. It's been, and a lot of respect. We respect each other so much. Like, we know we bring some of us respect <laughs> some of the people. We bring stuff down and we know they're just going to make it better. So, yeah. It's just insane. Nice. I have a follow up to that. Am I correct in, in saying that each one writer leads up an episode and then sort of other writers help with the editing? Is that typical of a television show creating a comedy or is that atypical? Um, I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the writers is sort of, a, we all pitch all the ideas out and we work really hard sort of making an outline and then one writer goes off and okay. writes the original draft and then once you write it, you sort of, it becomes the property of the staff again and we all rewrite it and um, and then but the person who's sort of the point person is, is on it from from day one and is on the set and is an editing and stuff and then you know you edit it and you get it exactly the way that you think it's best and then uh, Greg comes down and points out why what you did was stupid and terrible <laughs> and then he fixes it and makes it good. Uh, another fan question, um, this is for Greg. Do you think at some point you'll have to explain why this fictional camera crew is now in its fourth year of filming this documentary? Can you ignore that indefinitely? I think yes. <laughs> there's, um, there's a lot of stories from the world of documentaries, of documentaries taking years and years to film. I think Hoop Dreams took six years to film or something like that. And, uh, there's others that take even longer, and I think it's typical with documentaries that you know they don't necessarily have big budgets, but they they invest years into a project. So whether that's actually true or not is what I believe. <laughs> As the show has progressed, the office work seems to have developed a relationship with the documentary crew. Is this growth a conscious choice made by the writers? This is from Jessica in Columbus, Ohio. Jen said it should answer that. Uh, yeah, occasionally we'll do an episode that kind of focuses, uh, like in, um, uh, there's an episode that I wrote where Pam was interacting with the uh, cameras, uh, trying to find out if Dwight and Angela were together, and um, uh, the cameras got involved, we had a lot of fun with that, we don't do that often, but it's fun when we get to do that, like, uh, we, Randall, our owner of cameraman, um, he had a direction of, like, he's really excited to show her something, and he kind of ran up to her desk instead of just the normal, you know, kind of zooming in and going, he just, so the camera was bouncing, and he wait, waited there to try and get her attention, and, and when she looked up, he, like, pointed out something. So we don't do that very often, but I think it's really fun. Randall our, our, is also our, our DP and a director of many episodes, and he's, like, the hidden member of the cast, he and Matt, because they, when they look around, at you can you get a sense of who the cameraman is. Well, how much of the show is improvised? You guys must get that question a lot. Like, can you uh, put that to rest here today? We encourage, we encourage a lot of uh, improvisation. And uh, once we kind of get it scripted, then, uh, you know, we, we'll, we'll throw out lines to the actors, and then they'll start playing with it, and we'll get other things from that. Well, what's interesting is that when, you, when people improvise, there's comedy, and then there's story when you have like an episode. And most often, like 100% of the time, actually, um, actors will improvise in comedy. But then when you have to edit it, you don't have a, you know, Steve's not usually like, the reason I did this was because you don't have a lot of improv improvisation on story. So it's, even though it's hilarious, a lot of times it's cut out. I'll also say, uh, I believe that the fact that the actors know that there is improvisation coming up helps the scenes feel real. Because if there was a large gap between how you felt delivering the scripted line and how relaxed and natural you felt when improvising the line, we'd be able to tell that, that, that something was off in the way things were written or the way things were being performed. So I think that as a part of the process actually helps the, the entire show and, and the scripted lines feel improvised as well. And actually, with us uh, being on set, the writer, whoever wrote the first draft is on set, uh, the actors are really cool about uh, you know, pretty much doing the lines and then saying, hey, I had an idea for this, I had an idea for that, and 
you know, can I try it? And, and you know, it usually works out great. So it's that and kind of relationship. It goes back to, like, they start with the, the lines as written, then they improvise a version of them, and then often they look back at the original lines with a, you know, a new understanding of them from improvising it, and they end up doing the lines as written, but more naturally. What are some of the obstacles the writers have faced when dealing with producing these four one-hour-long episodes to open the season? This is from, this is from Charlotte in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Um, there are a, a, many of them. Um, one of them was that they couldn't just be hour-long episodes. They had to be episodes that when they are shown in repeats, they could be broken up neatly into two half-hour parts, um, which was very difficult. It was very hard to construct stories that would like arc over two episodes, but individually could work as just one episode. But the end of the first episode had to feel like an end of the first episode, right. but also it had to be like, wait, there's more. Um, I would say the biggest thing though is that you know the, the way that we uh, shoot the show is that we shoot way more stuff than we need, um, like way more stuff than we need, which is why there's so many deleted scenes on the internet and stuff, and and you know for every 21 minute and 30 second show that normally airs our first editor's assembly is like 35 or 38 minutes long and i think if the show is good it's because we keep cutting it down and cutting it down until it's like a finely honed little uh, comedy nugget and when so when the show was an hour long which meant it had to be 42 minutes long we ended up with editor's assemblies that were like 70 minutes long they were essentially movies and it's just more than twice as hard to edit and and uh, fix and, and and hone something that's 70 minutes long and something that's 42 minutes long, you know. So. And it was hard, I think, that on, on everyone, and I think I think we yeah. really enjoyed it. Um, but it was, you know, it, instead of taking 10 days to shoot it, we did it in eight days. So it was just. Uh, it, was it was like, like an, an obstacle course. course. It was an obstacle course. <laughs> like a crazy it was obstacle course. Crazy fun and interesting and challenging. Yeah, but, um, but a lot of work. We got a couple more fan questions here. Uh, this is Melissa in McDonald, Ohio. Uh, it's from Michael Schur. I love you as Mo Schrute. What's it like being both a writer and actor on this? <laughs> I'm certainly not an actor. <laughs> Whatever you think of me. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, it's, uh, it's a little odd because, you know, the other writer actors on the show, um, Paul and Mindy and BJ, uh, are, are playing, uh, well, less, less BJ than Paul and Mindy, but are playing essentially exaggerated versions of their natural selves. Yes. <laughs> and, um, in my case, so are you, so are you. it's exactly the same as Mike. Uh, the only thing I have in common with Moe's is that in real life I am an Amish beef farmer. But I just, <laughs> so I, I have to work a little harder. <laughs> How long does it take to glue on the beard? Is that like? <laughs> well, for the record, I want this out there, people. The first time I played Moe's, uh, the beard was real. It was honest to God. And it took me three and a half months to grow it. <laughs> My wife uh, left me. And, uh, and uh, it, it happened in part because my natural uh, beard growth is very weird and Amish looking. And uh, some of the other people up here thought that it might be funny to force me to grow it for three and a half months. And uh, I, I came back, I made one contract demand when I came back as Moses, which was that I would not actually grow the beard. And uh, so the, the last time it was a glue on. It looked okay, right? It looked fine. I, I, I pretty much could have totally gotten away with gluing it on the first time, I think. So somewhere at NBC, there's just like a uh, creative, prosthetic Bose beard? Yes. Well, it's actually right now it's in the Smithsonian, but it'll be back in a couple months. Thanks a lot. Uh, so do we have another one? This one is for BJ Ormandy. Uh, it's from Sarah Q in 44. Uh, it's a local PA town here. Uh, what do you are producing? What are your producing responsibilities on the show? Uh, producer, I think, means uh, super duper way to go writer. I think uh, in our case, the writers have all been given by Greg uh, a lot of uh, sort of uh, opportunity for input. You know, uh, Greg solicits opinions from. Uh, his inner circle, and I, I would call the writers. Actually, the inner circle in the show is pretty large. There's a lot of creative input. But, um, well, to, to answer your question on technical level, I think 
producer is, is often simply a title that is just given to writers after a certain amount of time, but it reflects a reality that in television, more than in films, writers are the ones making a lot of key decisions, influencing things on the set, um, dealing with the actors and directors to a large extent. So I, I think that we all do that, all the writer producers, but I think all the writers who are not credited as producers more or less do that too on our show. And, and so that gets more into like what you were saying, where you'll have the, the person who wrote the first draft of the episode on set, kind of making decisions in there and, and helping out. Yeah, generally that person who writes the first draft, who's the writer of the episode, is the point person on set during that script and interacts with the director and often interacts with the actors through the director, you know. Um, I think one of the kind of terrifying things about when you are a producer is that when you're a younger writer, you're then, the way that our staff is so big now that we oftentimes have to split up and you have someone run the room and that means they sit at the computer while other writers are around you and you're the one that kind of decides the order that things are written down or what maybe is on story and what isn't. You're, and that's a really kind of scary, powerful position. And as a producer, I feel like you're more often than not asked to do that, which is like terrifying for me. All we were seeing is often the one at the computer, and Mindy actually wrote a song about what it's like when Paul's at the computer. Are you seeing that? Okay, well, this is going to just make it sound me. But like when Greg or Jen say run the room, they're fast typers, they're good spellers, and um, the, it's, it's fine because you're all watching Paul's it on the but the song is justified. And so Paul, like, I, he hunts and pecks, he misspells things, oftentimes his hand will slip and we're like all of a sudden in an Excel document. And like, we're all like watching it, and oftentimes he'll just start going to YouTube because someone forwarded him like a, a cat mauling something. And we're like, Paul, we're supposed to be watching this. And as you know, Paul is like, on the show, Toby's characteristic is that he's infuriatingly slow sometimes to Michael. You feel like Michael when Paul's You feel like Michael. And so one time we were doing a rewrite really late and Paul's at the computer, I wrote a song, which we all know, so we can all sing it, which is, Paul is at the computer, everybody blow your brains out. sense of like, oh my god, I'm gonna get fired, oh my god, I'm no good, I can't believe I have this job, I've scanned the system, but you're just like generating jokes, you're considered just to be like a, a joke machine. Um, as a producer, you can kind of say things like, um, I'm a joke machine, also, I don't think that that character would do that, and you get to be like that kind of guy, which is more fun, you get to have like a little bit more investment, and so um, you're allowed to have more opinions about larger things, but not as many opinions as like a co-EP, or EP, let's say. <laughs> Anytime you see a really weird name on the show, it's probably Mike. Mike comes up with the craziest names, to, and I don't know if anyone, I think this made the final cut, but the, somebody was named Gwendolyn Trundlebed, and Mike came back and heard her little... Also, so Mike Lee Trundlebed, Max Trundlebed, or Toby Flenderson. Yeah. Crazy. It's like if Paul's thing is that he's terrible at the computer, Mike's thing is that as if he's like a very funny, very brilliant comedy writer, if you have any name thing, he goes into like nonsense land. It was a joke that if you would be nothing happier would be if you had like a Swedish phone book. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was what Paul said he was gonna get me for my birthday, it was a Swedish phone book. Because every name I come up with is like Gern Grundleman and <laughs> Lars Larsmanson and stuff. As a matter of fact, in the episode that, that, uh, that we just did, uh, there's a scene in the deposition where they're, they're reading off the names of the people in the room, and the last two names are uh, Ted Grundleman and Toby Flenderson. We <laughs> thank Mike for that. It's the proudest moment of my life. But in, in this one episode that we did, uh, The Return, when Dwight was, uh, had, had quit the job and was looking around in, uh, for other jobs and stuff, he was interviewing with a bunch of people, and, and uh, it was just very short scenes, and the people didn't have names or they didn't have lines. And so uh, it was very late at night, and I wrote in that the woman's name that he was interviewing with was named Gwendolyn Trundlebed for no reason. And then the, our set designers, who were fantastic, saw that this woman's name was Gwendolyn Trundlebed and thought that we were trying to say something about her character. And she literally was next to her. She just sat there and stared at, at Dwight. And they designed her office in this incredibly like elaborate, girly way. Like she was like really into fairies and very ethereal. The whole office. 
was pink. And when we got to the set, it was like, what is happening? And then I was like, let's go to the tunnel bed, you know? It's just an interesting office. Uh, that did not deter me, however, from creating 20,000 other stupid names. We've been playing with Nerf guns in the office, and I put a Nerf gun to Mike's head the other day and, and said, I will shoot you if you don't give me a normal boy's name, because we're trying to name something, and he couldn't. Uh, quick show of hands. Uh, no, actually, just make some noise. Who here is from Scranton? Oh Maybe you can see where we're going with this, Greg. Who <laughs> here's from not from Spain? I'm ready for your question now. <laughs> I take it everyone is here and uh, is familiar with the Lazy Scranton video? Yeah. I think you want to know who's behind the Lazy Scranton video. Um, Brent wrote the episode. I, I think that was me telling him to put it in because we talked about this is the you have to kind of compete to be cool a little bit in the office in the, in the writers' room, which is hard for me because I'm old and dorky. And uh, so uh, I got all excited about Lazy Monday that I saw. Somewhere, and it's like, hey, do you see this? Somebody sent me a link to Lazy Monday. They're like, oh, this is horrible, this is stupid. We do Lazy Sunday, that's the cool one. And, um, um, and then I started researching it, uh, and everybody had done Lazy, some, some version of Lazy Sunday. There was Lazy Snellville, Georgia. There was Lazy Ramadi, uh, some soldiers did in Iraq. And everybody did a version of it, and I thought it would be funny if Michael did one really late. And, um, <laughs> Right? I think that's how it came about. Yeah, and, and so, and then Brent wrote it and, and you know, supervised it and produced it and everything. We, you know what we've really gotten a lot out of, which is funny, is the Chamber of Commerce sent us a deck of playing cards. 52 playing cards at each, the back of each one of them was a different Scranton location. And that's how we've come up with almost all of the Scranton locations. <laughs> Especially for, for um, the Lazy Sunday, because there was Montage Mountain and there was the Electric City sign and all different things were on the back of this deck of playing cards. There was a half a day where the deck was lost and it was like a code hey. red in the office. <laughs> Why was Scranton chosen in the first place? You know, people ask me that all the time. And, um, there's a whole bunch of different reasons. I was reading John O'Hara stories at the time of the, the pilot, who's a great writer and sets a lot of his stuff here. <laughs> Smattering of applause. <laughs> Um, paper Magic is the uh, a paper company that does children's valentines, uh, and it says Made in Scranton on the back of Scooby-Doo Valentines that I uh, had gotten around the same time for my kids. Uh, there's a lot of different things. I, I think it was still maybe floating around when, when John Krasinski came here before the show with his, when he was coming out for the pilot. Maybe not, but he came here with his, some buddies of his and shot the footage that's in our opening title sequence, and he interviewed um, different Scranton paper personalities, like a, a pen paper and paper magic, and the behavior of him going around with the camera crew, asking the managers of these paper companies uh, to show him around, it mimicked exactly what we were going for, kind of. And so we were like, yeah, that's a, that's a thumbs up. That works. And there's just a hundred little things. And uh, I'm really glad I did, though. I don't think we've gotten this uh, reception in in Utica. Yes. Can you just give us a little bit of insight on just how you got involved in, in the business? I just wanted to say, in terms of education, Anthony, Anthony and I are going to be starting a master's program in comedy writing. It's going to cost uh, $200,000 a year. So uh, we're accepting applications now. It is not accredited. Does anybody else want to give any more well, insight? One thing I've been kind of recommending lately to people who want to kind of get in is, is doing improv classes. But I feel like you have to be on your feet, you have to pitch something. If it's funny, great. If it's not funny, you can't just kind of melt down and disappear. You have to pitch another thing. And, and so I think it, it builds confidence. So if it's something you're interested in doing, I would recommend something like that. Uh, another uh, way to do it is uh, the way Gene Studnitsky did it, which was 
he was Larry David's nanny. <laughs> not him. Uh, not Larry David. Harold oh, Ramis. Harold Ramis. Harold, he was Harold Ramis. Although I did uh, babysit Larry's kids once in a while. Right. That was hard for Harold. This is this is honestly not true. That's how we got into show business. Yeah. I didn't really want to go into show business. I wanted to be a nanny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll say on a creative level, I think it's important to write for an audience if you want to be a comedy writer. That's important to develop, not simply to write essays for an assignment or follow a book, to develop a, a voice that actually honestly entertains your friends or readers of your school paper or magazine or people on the internet. You learn a lot from an audience. And, and we have learned that simply from screening cuts of the show again and again to people we know. and. and you know, people within the staff. And definitely from stand-up, there's a saying that I was taught when I started doing stand-up, which is never blame the crowd. And often, it makes sense to lay a little blame on the crowd, but it's better for you to develop if you always think, well, what could I have done better? What was lame in my act? What could have been more novel and more creative? If you develop that for your friends in, in a way that they would enjoy reading what you write or watching what you do, that can really get you to, to a higher level creatively, and, and often that will be discovered. And there's ma many books and people that can give you advice on the business side, but, but getting somewhere creatively is, uh, is an important business side of it too. And also, uh, you know, if you really want to do this, you got to basically move to LA and do it. You know, it's, you, can't, you can't be in, in, in you know, the middle of the country somewhere writing, writing your scripts, hoping someday you're going to be a writer. You have to, except for some, some of us who start off in New York, like sure wrote for uh, Saturday Night Live, uh, but uh, you, you kind of have to come to LA and grind it out and write sample scripts and hustle, and it's hard. It's really, really hard to break in, so it's, you have to be fully committed to it. Well, I, if you're very really good, you can break in. That's the one thing that I think that um, it's always makes people, I think most writers don't feel great about encouraging people who want to be writers because you know how many people try and don't, you know, aren't able to do it. But on the other hand, as somebody who hires writers, anytime I see a script that's really A plus great, you know, Justin Spitzer was the best script of the year that I was reading scripts and he had gotten hired on another show and I had him in the back of my head and it was this one um, Scrubs episode that he did. And Lee and Jean, Lee and Jean had a pilot that was incredibly brilliant. And you know, if you can get it up to the level where it's it's the best script out of the stack of 100 scripts that somebody's reading, you will definitely get hired. But that's a very hard thing to do. And it's half comedy, and it's also half understanding playwriting, and you know, just the dynamics of what makes an interesting character and how long it goes story should last and when you should cut to a subplot. And there's a lot of elements in it that aren't comedic too. And my personal way of, of getting better at it, I think it's really, this is so, sounds so simple, but I think it's really good if you want to improve your writing to take a show that you like, put it on, on a pause, like on a tape or DVR or something, and transcribe it from your looking at it. And I don't know why, but I think that's, that helps a lot. I haven't ever heard anybody suggest that because it's so time consuming. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I wrote my first scripts, I, um, God, I was watching, I think Frasier was, was the, the first uh, scripts I tried writing, and I uh, would watch them, and I started so geeky. I would uh, write down how many jokes were in every scene and um, what the joke formulas were. I mean, it seems like it was so hacky. Um, and I, I tried to fake my way, pretend I was, was writing a script. Uh, by copying as many of the structures. Uh, and then eventually you change enough and all of a sudden it's a completely different script and you kind of know how to do it. You do that one or two more times and all of a sudden it becomes second hand. I think another thing is just plan on just throwing a bunch of stuff in the garbage really early. Like when I first got out of college, I was like, okay, well first I'm going to write the greatest Malcolm Speck ever written. And so you just like eat yourself up with this and then after I burned myself out and worked in advertising and then hit that, uh, I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to throw out the first three things I write. They're going to be garbage. And uh, yeah, I pulled through on that. And then, you know, the actual good things maybe start coming out of the computer. But to say, like, the first time out, I'm going to, you know, write the best mad about you spec ever is probably unrealistic. But once you get over that, you can start feeling like stuff comes out of your computer quicker.
as you get deeper now that you're here and you've been driving around and seeing things, um, is there any chance maybe in some of your minds to maybe make the show a little more scranted? Have you seen some things that have maybe surprised you that have maybe been inspirational to be like, you know, we need to get that in the show pretty soon? I'd say yes. What do you, you guys were all, we were all in different cars driving around. What do you, what did you guys think was story generating? Uh, we took the coal mine uh, tour. <laughs> And it was very uh, interesting, and we, uh, you know, we were thinking of like trying to think of stories and stuff that we could do. And then slowly, over the course of the tour, the mind-numbingly horrifying conditions under which the coal miners had to work in the tour like pushed the thought of comedy so far out of our brains <laughs> that we couldn't, we couldn't focus anymore. Um, but no, we've done a lot of things. I think we're going to at least try to work in somehow. And there's a there's a, a very um, sad problem, just fact of life, which is that you know we shoot the show in a miserable uh, industrial complex in Van Nuys, California, and it just doesn't look anything like Scranton. You know, as we were driving around, it's and we knew that a lot of us grew up in the Northeast and everything, so we sort of knew that intuitively. But it makes me a little bit sad that we just can't replicate the look and the feel of the town as much as we would like, I think, because we live in a desert with a lot of abandoned warehouses. My question is for any of the writers, um, what kind of leeway do you have on the characters' backstories? I mean, do you have like a Bible that you just have a set set of facts, or can you be creative? Jason, when you were a writer's assistant, did you keep some sort of Bible? I did. Um, you, uh, th there is a Bible. We don't really have it handy so much anymore. Um, but there's just kind of a listing of all kinds of facts, anything that's appeared in the show. Any kind of research kind of goes into there, so there is there's a Bible. You know what's really weird is that is that we generate more ideas by a factor of ten than we ever use, and so some of these pitches, what they what we call it, when the writers throw out a suggestion in the room, you you kind of fall into the back of your head and you don't remember whether or not that was ever written, if it was written, whether it was shot, if it was shot, whether it aired, if it aired, whether it aired on TV or on the on, online. So you can get con you can get confused, and then what happens is it just floats around until you have to make a decision, and it just becomes possibilities. And it could be like, like for example, characters' religions. You know that floats around. And if you had a great story idea that Pam needed to be Catholic or something like that, now we can't do it because she's been established as Presbyterian. <laughs> so it, it, every time you make a decision, you kind of limit things. So it's best to kind of keep it open as much as possible so you don't paint yourself into a corner and cut off a good story. Well, so, so the backstory is kind of like Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It's kind of like, this is good, this is good, I'm going to keep going with this. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes we'll make these, um, these jokes that you just pitch as a joke and then they have these enormous stakes that you don't think about until later. For instance, the Kelly Kapoor character has a sister who died. And that was a talking head that I think Jean and Lee wrote, which is now part of her backstory that she's this horrible tragedy, but because she's not real, we think it's funny, so we wrote the joke. But that's part of her story. And there was another thing which I think is so funny, which is in um, Conflict Resolution, our second season, they go around and there's a note in the, um, not conflict, a performance review, there's a note that was stuck in the box from a character named Tom. Tom said, I wish there was more outreach for people with depression. And Michael says, and Michael's like, what is this? And he's like, who's Tom? And, and, and then Phyllis goes, Tom, you know? So essentially what happened is a person who worked in an office, which is only 14 people or so, was incredibly depressed, killed himself, <laughs> shot himself in the head, if we were to take Phyllis, what Phyllis said at face value. And it happened, ask for help, put a note in a box, and that happened a year ago, because Phyllis was a year ago. So if you time out the series, what we discovered was that his suicide happened a day before the pilot aired. <laughs> Tape the pilot. So when, in our pilot episode, when Michael is bringing around the temp and saying, this is this person, this is this person, oh, we all just came back from the funeral of Tom. He kind of killed himself. So you, like, these jokes have verifications we don't even think about. So. That time was much more affected by the death of Sprinkles than he was by the death of Tom. It never occurred to me that Ryan was probably there as a temp to replace Tom. <laughs> It also made me wonder if the documentary crew was set there in response. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to investigate the tragedy. What made a man do this? <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and they're like, oh, this boss is kind of funny. Let's just follow this guy. There's <laughs> Tom Who, am I right, people? <laughs> they just stay to see who's next. Right, so I got one for, uh, I don't know if it's for BJ or about BJ, but here, here we go. Um, why did you decide to make Ryan such a butt this year? <laughs> Obviously, it was juiciest if Ryan changed as much as possible, and um, or at least revealed himself as much as possible. The beard was a part of that. I had written into the initiation script that Mose appears with his beard. Uh, I then read Mike Sherry's draft of Gunner Mifflin Infinity that described Ryan with a goatee, uh, which I was not looking forward to wearing the whole year. Greg uh, looked at my beard that was about to become a goatee and said, I don't know if you would wear that. I think goatees aren't really cool right now. Right next to me were Leslie Lewis and Anthony, who then began growing his goatee into a beard, Anthony, after I heard that comment. I don't know if that was by chance. I cried that I started growing my beard. But, um, I think, uh, I think it's just juiciest to, to have contrast in the show always, and that's why someone who, you know, was a temp and now the boss and has this weird psychosexual uh, hints of of, um, well, I'm pinning myself to a point here. Psychosexual I actually, I think that's more how it's interpreted than how it actually originates. But, um, why is Ryan such a butt to get back to that? Uh, I think, uh, personally, as the actor who plays Ryan, I think that he is insecure and not used to his power and tells himself and other people that he is in this great position of authority and, uh, and tries to compensate by acting like it. And I've also seen a lot of people act in his way, say these things. I have been criticized for spending too much time on my Blackberry when I could be interacting with other people <laughs> and pushing jokes. So um, I, I think, uh, you know, maybe some of it was based on observation in the writer's room. And, uh, and some of it is just, the, I think, the juiciest way to to play a character who, in some ways, has to be replaced Jan as an antagonist for Michael. It's also, just, just to add, I mean, I, one of the things I think we sort of delight in and the way DJ's playing the role and the way uh, we get to write the role is that he's really Hollywood. Like, like uh, he, he's definitely, like, could be an agent at an agency, uh, like a talent agent or something, and uh, so I think we also get to have a little bit of fun. It might be a bit of an inside joke, but we get to take little stabs at lampooning our own business uh, with this sort of just... Oh, just silliness of it, and, uh, and the self-importance of it. Oh, hi, my name is Dan, I'm kind of big into like, film and video editing, so I was curious, like, um, like what role like, in, like, in writing does like, post-production have, like, just like in general? Uh, it's really big, and you know, uh, there could be other panels that would be very interesting with Randall and his team and with the Post guys. They're you know, a lot of fun. I blog with Dave Rogers. Who's one of our editors? We have two editors uh, who just won the Emmy for their editing on the show, and they. Holland, um, and because we shoot so much, there's no way that we could keep our jobs as writers and look at every take, you know, and um, or certainly I can't. And so there's enormous reliance on the editors taste to go through all the different versions and the improvs and everything and select what they consider to be the best taste and then they, they put the show together and usually when we get in the editing room it's like all right maybe we don't need this scene but there is an enormous amount of take swapping so their taste is huge uh, at, at selecting of all the work the actors do all the 60 hours that they shoot a uh, week or whatever more right because there's two cameras running there's enormous amounts of tape that they have to watch, and then they select all the best performances out of that. And um, it's a huge, huge and important job. Who started first, Jim or Pam? I think the most compelling thing we ever did on it was an alternate talking head ending to the client where Jim told this beautiful story of his first day um, at work uh, where he went out to lunch with this uh, person and um, it was both his best first date and his worst first date because he found out that she was engaged. And 
to me, that means that she was there before him. And that, that was such a good talking head, such a good moment, that that like, got burned into my head. But I, apparently, we previously had said the other way around. Uh, so I don't know. Because uh, <laughs> I'm going to say that, that uh, Pam was there first. Uh, has there been any thought in outsourcing certain departments and having, say, Kelly compete with her cousin Kimmy from Calcutta? <laughs> it's funny, um, actually, that it brings up a, something that I wish BJ was here, or Paul or here, which is that when you're a writer performer on the show, um, you, we all work on the annex. And there's a period last year where we did this trick of a very funny story move, which is that Michael is very angry with Ryan and moves him to the annex. And that was because when we were in the annex, you don't see us, and so we can take off our costumes and go back to the writer's room. Um, if you're asking if Greg is thinking about firing me, I think he has to answer that. <laughs> Are you ever going to meet Michael's mother that lives in Dixon City? Aww. Why Dixon City? Very possibly we'll meet her. Um, we, uh, we got an award once from the television critics, and Carol Burnett was there. And um, she made, uh, she was lovely, made a pitch to be Michael's mother. Um, <laughs> So I, I've been kind of reluctant to do that, though, because it feels like on a documentary to see a big, famous actress like that would hurt it. So uh, let's, let's use this as a test case. So, all right, what do you think of celebrity guest stars in general? Well, how about Carl Burnett? Federation guys anytime soon. I love, I love the outtake when you're uh, not delivering the bread when you guys go to hit on Pam in Valentine's Day, and I just wanted to know if we're going to see them anytime soon. Uh, that's actually a question for Greg. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, these guys write each other into each other's scripts. I don't know if you recognize Justin Spitzer as the intern, though, from the uh, fun run. He's got to be Say your line. Say your line. Open your mouth by the audience. <laughs> Justin, can you uh, can you say your famous line? Uh, so that's where your uterus went. <laughs> Some of them have been holding out. Jen, Jen, Jen Slut has been holding out for I a better part. I desperately want to be a shrew. So, <laughs> until that part gets offered. Yeah, we would love, love to put more Leo and Gino in. The interesting thing about Leo and Gino, it's not, maybe it's not the interesting thing about Leo and Gino, a thing about, interesting thing about Leo and Gino is that Lee plays Gino, and Gene plays Leo. That, that was done to confuse our editor, Dave Rogers, who sometimes the uh, lines of reality blur when he's editing it. He calls B.J. Ryan and Mindy Kelly, it's unclear if he knows what's actually happening. <laughs> it's been so much time editing. So. He's constantly looking at a fake camera. Yeah. I mean, he's doing takes with the camera that's not there. Like, can you believe these people? Since all of you have so much creative control in the episodes, then how much control do the directors have? You have people like Joss Whedon and J.J. Abrams. So I was wondering how much input they have since you guys seem to have a lot of control in your it makes a huge difference. Um, we just we just watched Branch Wars, the uh, you know the one that's coming up. We just we even directed that's coming up on Thursday. Uh, uh, he's a really good comedy director, and uh, a lot of a lot of what you'll see is that um, if there's a lot of deleted scenes, it's because the director was really good, and then it's really hard to get down the time, and uh, sometimes. You know, it's, it's a stretch to get some deleted scenes. Um, uh, but no, the directors had a, a whole lot. But these guys, it all depends. It's like, it becomes like a little collaboration. You know, like uh, Jen Salata and Harold Ramis were a great team. And, and um, 
you know, different, uh, and, and Mike and, and Charles McDougall made a great team, and uh, I don't know, they, these guys could talk more about what it's like to work with the individuals. Well, it's also not just writers and directors, it's, it's really writer, uh, director, actor, and Randall, I would say. And, uh, and everything is, is there's, always, there's a lot of confabbing, and there's a lot of sort of um, discussion and, and sort of free-flowing ideas and stuff, but there are times when there's a director who's just so, just straight up awesome that you just feel like you're worthless because they're doing everything that you would do before you can have a chance to know that you would do it. Um, and the, the first episode that Josh Whedon directed, which was, uh, which is uh, his business school, um, like that his, he did like an editor, a uh, director's cut of his episode, and it was like, I, 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 we watched it and I just, I didn't know what you would do to change it. Um, and it, there, and just partly because just, there's some directors who just know, who love the show and, and have, know the visual style of the show, and so that's not a problem, you know, they never try to do things that we wouldn't ordinarily do. And they just set up really good shots and get really great performances out of people, and then that's when the job is really easy, is when the director is really good. Also, Ken Klockas has, has made a huge impact on the show, because he directed the pilot, Diversity Day, and Casino Night, and Gay Witch Hunt, and a lot of our big episodes, Blue Screws, and, um, and he kind of set up our, our way of interacting, uh, where the cast is very protected and on the set all the time, and the people who usually service the cast, like makeup and hair and stuff like that, and can slow it down and remind everybody that they're in Hollywood, not in Scranton, is kept to a minimum, and they're always like off, off camera, and the, the cast have their own little compacts to do their makeup on their own and stuff. And, uh, he set up a lot of a lot of things that really helped us, you know, in our process to, to make the show what it is. My question is kind of a two-parter. The first part is, what is your favorite catchphrase that each of you have created yourself? And the second part is, who's responsible for I'm in love with Italian food? And can we see Pam reciprocate that? Oh, uh, uh, Paul. Paul Lieberstein uh, wrote uh, the, I believe, right? I'm in love with Italian food. The gym talking head. Yeah, I believe that's Paul. Favorite catchphrase? You know who's got a lot of catchphrases? Ed Helms. I agree with this call. The catchphrases come from the actors, because like, like um, in the script it might say, you know, like, shut up or something, and then when Steve turns out to shut it, you know, and the way he says it, it kind of becomes a catchphrase, and then, then we start using it. But I think that they probably come up with most of them. Who, who, who first pitched uh, That's What She Said? Yeah! That's a very common, I, I found my like, college and high school thing, that, that's what she said. And now that it's in all of our heads, I bet, I guarantee you there will be one or two for the question and answer sessions over. Because it, it gets stuck in your head and then you see so many options to use it, that's what she said. It's, it's to the point now we're in the writer's room, we're just pitching and someone will say something and you'll be like, and you'll have a point that you have to make, but you can't stop, so you're like, well I think Michael should, that's what she said, you should try to should you really do this. Is there, is there, is there Joy in it anymore, even. It's like a, it's like a tape that we keep for Michael, too. It's a compulsion at this point. Sometimes he has to put an issue to rest with that's what she said before moving on. Right. Something he believes in. Jen has that problem. I'm just going to say, Jen. Like, I mean, Jen can literally, like, you're trying to pitch in something and you look in her eyes and you know she's not thinking about anything but just, like, racing of how. Which is funny because it, it's a kind of like, Jen's like a classy lady, but that's a pretty, like, low floor of a joke. It's my favorite. In fact, Mike and Paul at one point sat me down last year and like, you have to pick your moments yeah. where you do that. That's what she said. <laughs> Just do them. Keep doing them. Do them a little less. Yeah. I like when Michael says, yes. Y-E-S-H. I didn't come up with it. I just think it's yeppers. yeppers. I have a question.
question um, from Mindy and PJ. Um, I've noticed, especially last season, that the, the episodes that you write tend to um, center around your character a little bit more than um, otherwise. So I was wondering if you if you feel yourself biased a little bit towards developing your own character and getting to do what you feel like, because who knows their character better than you guys, right? So that, you know, things that maybe other people might not come up with and a little biased towards gearing the story around your character. What part of Diwali did you think I had to do with me or anything about them? Or casting my actual parents in an episode? How dare you? How dare all of you? No, it's fun. I mean, it's really, when you get to write an episode, sometimes you get, you, it's, you know, I get asked this question, and um, it, is, it is fun to write. I mean, like, I'm a performer, and it is fun to write stuff for yourself. And um, it's, if you can do it, and it's good, and it's organic, then I, I think in Diwali it was nice, because Kelly was the catalyst for them being able to hang out with a bunch of Indian people and see, like, you know, Michael doing Indian dancing and stuff. So that's, it was like, it worked. When, like, for instance, in uh, the episode, you guys were watching a clip of, I didn't, Kelly is not in the episode, because it didn't really serve a purpose I couldn't find a way that her character could have like a comment of what was going on or part of it, though I tried. <laughs> I tried. So, she pitched a like, narration for Kelly. Yes, yes. It's going to be a dream that Kelly well, had. Well, just granted, everybody. Oh my god, you guys, it's Rage Wars. <laughs> Mike is constantly like, how do we put Moe's into the convention? Could Moe's come along with Pam and Angela when they talk about Dwight? You know, like, he's always just trying to put himself in. Come to work with that beard on, <laughs> sit at a desk, say, wouldn't it be funny if Moe's did this, Moe's did that. And also, you guys know that, like, the team, Lee and Jean, were not sitting next to, to each other to appear like autonomous units. <laughs> Our, are also characters on the show that play Leo and Gino, who work in advanced refrigeration. And I, uh, we, we talked about that. Are you in? I was in the bathroom? Some other time. Okay, sorry, I missed it. But like, you know, yeah, it's, it's a temptation, but you know, oftentimes you are not in your own episode. BJ, same thing for you? Yeah, uh, well, sometimes there's an episode, like, I, I believe Mike came up with the idea for the fire. And uh, Greg assigned it to me just because it seemed like a good fit, you know. When I started the fire, how about you know, the guy who plays Ryan writes the episode, and uh, that that was great. And uh, you know, sometimes though, I prefer it when someone else writes Ryan because it will push me more. Like when I read uh, Mike's draft for Gunner Mifflin Infinity, I wouldn't have thought because as the actor plays Ryan, I'm always thinking, well, what would he do? What would he feel? How would it be real? And to see things that that were more extreme than I would have guessed, uh, it's not something I would have written, but it made it much more interesting. And it was fun to play. Well, how could he do this? How could he pull this off? How could this be fun? How could this be, uh, how, how would it be justified? And, and that, I think, is a much more interesting contrast when someone else pushes the character and you have to figure out how to do it. Let me say this. Everybody realizes how important and unprecedented it is to have almost every writer from the best show on TV in Scranton right now. But I think we all agree that it's great that you're here, number one, but number two, it's also great that you are as funny as we wanted you to be right now. <laughs> Thank you so much.